The title of this talk, the subtitle, is uh, Environmental Data Systems as Memory, Truce, and Target. That title is, comes from an old book, uh, the evolution, the, An Evolutionary Theory of Technological Change by Nelson and Winter that was written in 1982. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that idea and then launch into some things about environmental data systems. Yeah. So Nelson and Winter were writing in the 1980s uh, about big organizations and how they survive and change. And they, they, a lot of their book is about routines and skills and the relation between them, so skills in individuals and routines in organizations as ways of maintaining memory. So for an organization, uh, holding knowledge over time is often about having a routine that new employees learn. You know, how is it possible that the organization persists even though new people are coming and going all the time? They learn the routines and they carry forward. The idea of the truce in this book was about the relations between, for example, managers and workers or marketing and engineers, you know, different parts of an organization, how they function together. And the idea was there, once routines are established, they effectively function as a truce, even in the condition where people, there's tension, opposition, sometimes defiance, breaking of rules. So the routine is a way of keeping the, the organization at peace, as it were, even as it, those tensions uh, persist. And the last piece, the idea of a target in this book, was that uh, as things change, as new processes need to be employed in an organization, uh, older routines function as uh, norms or goals or ways of uh, centering the organization on, an, on the same principle of building a routine using now a new process. So I'm going to apply some of this to, the, to environmental data systems. These two are ways of holding memory. That's a more obvious concept. Uh, in the case of long-term data sets, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is that data are not static. They change over time. Our data about the past change over time. And that has a lot to do with algorithms and how we process them. The idea of the truce in this context is that data systems continue to work even though there are tensions, conflicts, uh, differing norms, different organizations trying to work together, lots of uncertainty, and sometimes uh, questioning of the very basis of those uh, data systems. And then the concept of a target in this context, same thing. You know, when it, I, I, tend, I study mostly weather and climate, and in that case there are thousands of different kinds of instruments and communities around those instruments that all have to function together. So as new pieces of data systems, such as satellites, come online, the older routines become the norm to which those systems must adapt. I could say much more about this, but I'm just going to leave that on the table because there's another meaning of target, which is probably what you were expecting, <laughs> and that's this one. And that's the current context and a lot of what this talk will be about, the targeting of environmental data systems uh, by skeptics and climate change deniers. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about knowledge infrastructures, what that idea is, and then move forward into memory and truce and three different climate data controversies, and then finally uh, the current siege. So what's a knowledge infrastructure? To me, this is a phrase that captures certain kinds of things like national census bureaus, weather forecast centers, bureaus of labor statistics, the centers for disease control, and uh, many other data systems that are normally relatively uncontroversial. People just accept the output as uh, part of their routine work. There's lots of other kinds of data systems that are on the cutting edge, on the research edge, and there there's much more tension and uncertainty. I'm talking about the things that function routinely and reliably, that are widely shared and widely accepted. 
So let me move into talking about weather knowledge, because this is my subject and a great place to look at things. Very, very old. So here we have a poster from the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC from 1926. And they're already <coughs> celebrating their, what is this, the uh, 80th anniversary of the Smithsonian. And you, as you see, the first thing that the Smithsonian Institution did was to build meteorology. The Weather Service of the United States came out of that institution in, starting in the 1840s and then moving forward. So developing systematic studies uh, over 25 years and turned into the Weather Bureau. In Europe, uh, international weather services began very quickly after the installation of international telegraph lines. Uh, that, that was a way, you know, in, in Europe, the countries are small and weather moves fast. You need to know about your neighbors if you're going to make a weather forecast for your country. So sharing weather data was obvious, relatively uncontroversial, even in wartime. And, uh, you know, so this is a map of the telegraph system. Here we have a weather telegram from 1862. Uh, this system, the, the telegraph services provided transmission of weather data for nothing. So it was freely exchanged, and that meant that uh, every weather service could benefit from all the others. And that system developed into a global one uh, by the time of World War I. This is a weather forecast from 1872 made by the U.S. Uh, weather Department, uh, the War Department Weather Service at that time. Uh, the interest of this is mainly that it looks so much like a modern weather map. You know, there's a high pressure zone here. We have ISO lines of pressure, the map of the ocean currents. I know it's hard to see, but there are a few data points marked with wind direction. Modern weather maps look much the same, but uh, just with better graphics. So surface stations were the basis of the global weather forecast system. and you know, as you see here, in 1870, Europe and the eastern United States were pretty well covered. By 1960, the land masses of the world were pretty much fully covered by surface stations in a sense. You have to realize that these rings here have a radius of 1,000 kilometers, so they're really counting on, uh, it's a very coarse view of the weather. But nonetheless, this is a you know, very, very dense network of uh, observing stations. The big change in weather forecasting, the thing that made it what it is now, and actually you know, for the first time made it possible to forecast weather beyond about 18 hours or, 20, or 48 hours, was the introduction of computers in the 1950s. And what we see here is the skill score of US weather forecasts Starting in 1955, when they first introduced computerized weather forecasts, these are different computers coming in. And each time a new computer comes in, that enables a greater density of uh, network processing. It enables them to build more complex weather models. And the skill score just keeps going up. So the th forecast for 36 hours here uh, the 72-hour forecast is as good as this was 15 years later. And it keeps, keeps on rising. This ends in about 2010. Uh, it's one of the most successful uh, algorithmic processes ever developed because it processes data from the entire planet, from uh, thousands of instruments of many different kinds, and uh, models them more or less successfully. Now, it's an interesting type of knowledge because it's probabilistic. I mean, everybody knows that the weather forecast is sometimes wrong. And yet, it's raining outside. I took this screenshot yesterday at around uh, <laughs> noon. And we, as we see, it's doing what it said it would do. And we, you, know, you, you can decide later if it, if, whether it's working for the, the out days. It gets less accurate over time. but. It's a, it's a very good system, and in many places, you can get quite accurate forecasts at the level of 15 minutes uh, for almost anywhere in the United States and many parts of Europe. Some places are harder to, to predict than others. 
So weather forecasting is a knowledge infrastructure. It's routine. It's widely accepted. You know, people, I don't know how many of you looked at the weather. Let me ask you, actually, how many people looked at the weather forecast this morning before you came out? Wow. <laughs> yes, many. And it probably had an influence. You probably decided whether or not to bring an umbrella. And it's, you know, it's also politically interesting because it has it developed in this period when uh, weather forecasts were so bad that the data had very little monetary value. And, so, and in that in combination with what I said earlier about how uh, you know, in a, in a, if you, the area of your nation is small, you need data from your neighbors, so everybody benefits from sharing. Those two things together meant that the norm in weather forecasting until about uh, 1995 was always to share data for nothing uh, everywhere in the world. OK. So with that as background, let me talk some about memory in environmental data systems. There's been a whole series of different techniques and technologies for this, starting, of course, with just plain paper records. This is a ship's log from the 1870s. Um, by 1914, we have this, which, you know, if you speak French, you would know that this means World Wide Web, essentially. It means a worldwide network. And this was a network of uh, climatological observing stations all over the world. Not a whole lot, about 500 of them, but uh, the, 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 uh, the Weather Service of the UK collected these and assembled them into books. They took many years to make. The one for 1914 came out in uh, 1921, and that was typical, seven or eight years between <coughs> an attempt to collect the data and then many rounds of exchange with the station saying, you haven't done this right. Uh, you haven't supplied all the data we need. Do this again. And mostly collected by mail. Uh, so finally, uh, producing these worldwide weather records. Of course, punch cards come in later. These are meteorological punch cards. And today, most of these data are stored on tape robots uh, when they are when they're sizable. <clears throat> I said earlier that data change. And what I mean by that is that, you know, it, it's really not a hard thing to see. If you have thousands of instruments all over the world, uh, how do you know that my thermometer here in Ottawa is reading the same thing as your thermometer in Moscow? So they're calibrated, but they're also checked against each other. And at, when things change, as in this image, uh, adjustments have to be made to the data. So here we are in Canada. Uh, in, at this moment in 1961, a new uh, precipitation gauge is introduced. And it just has dis different characteristics from the previous instrument. So it reads about 16% less than the previous instrument. And this is happening all over the world at different times. <laughs> so to get a, an accurate picture over time of what's happening to precipitation, you need to uh, know this in the first place. So that's metadata, data about where your data came from, how they were made. And then you need to find some way to adjust them. And that's done with algorithms. Here's another example. So this is snow cover measured from uh, polar orbiting satellites. You know, they can see the reflectance of the snow and they can me measure it. But over time, the algorithms used to process that data changed. We could say they improved, but if you're interested not in what's happening right now, but in what happened across the whole period of the past, you have to process them with the same algorithm. So they go back, they do this again, and you see that there's a stark difference between the solid line with the same data reduction algorithm and these data lines, which were made with different algorithms. 
Yet another example, this was a huge puzzle of the 1990s. Satellite data, you know, satellites are very different from other instruments because they're looking at a giant volume of, of, of air beneath them. They just measure radiance at the top of the atmosphere. They're only seeing one thing, and then it has to be disaggregated into the different levels of the atmosphere below it to be used in a weather model or a climate model. And uh, that's very complex, very heavily algorithmic, heavily modeled data, I would say. Radiosons are different. Those are weather balloons. You know, they rise up through the atmosphere, so they're measuring by contact. But instead of measuring a big volume, they're just measuring whatever piece of air they happen to be passing through at the moment. So it's like they're measuring a line, whereas the satellite is measuring a big volume. And the data reduction algorithms used to process this satellite data seemed to show that the troposphere, the layer of the air in which we live, was not warming, or not very much, across the period of satellite observations up through about 2000, whereas the radiosonde record showed something very different. So why this discrepancy? That was a big puzzle. And very often, this version of the satellite data was used as a hammer in the US Congress to say, actually, global warming's not really happening. Satellites, they're the coolest, newest technology, and they are going to give us a better measurement since they see the whole planet with one instrument. So we trust those, and we don't trust these other ones. Interestingly, so I, I, now I can't resist just getting very, very political about this. So, <laughs> so that data, the satellite data set I was just talking about, that instrument was run by two guys at the University of Alabama at Huntsville, Roy Spencer and John Christie. Roy Spencer is a, an evangelical who believes that the, uh, that the earth is not very old, even though he's a scientist. Um, he is you know, certain that climate change is not happening, and he keeps putting out stuff. John Christie is a little more uh, uh, respectable as a scientist, but also very skeptical and constantly called up before Congress, even just like uh, a month ago, uh, to testify that global warming is not happening or it's not as bad as we thought, something like that. When these data began to be processed in the 1990s and other scientists began to look at those, they, they saw that there were problems in the way that they were handling it. So, for example, you know, a, a satellite's orbit decays over time. It gets closer to the Earth. And when that happens, the angle of observation changes. But that had not been included in the processing algorithm. So another group called Remote Sensing Systems emerged to pr and, and took the same raw data and processed them through its algorithms, and they, there began this kind of competition between, between these two groups. And they would write papers and challenge each other about how they were processing it. And then over time, uh, the lines, the average lines between the weather balloons and the satellites began to converge. And today, they're very close together. The interesting thing here is this line down here. This is University of Alabama at Huntsville, version 5.2 of the data set, the same data set. RSS, version 3.2. So these data are versioned, and they're, it's still the picture of the past, but it's a different past now. OK, on to truce. So I like to use this metaphor of the glass laboratory. In a lot of ways, this is what the ideal of science has always been. You know, scientists publish. That means they make their knowledge public. And they, do, they have uh, peers, other experts, review their work. And that's part of how it's certified as valid knowledge. That's what the methods section is. The methods section tells you, even if you weren't there, what they did and how they did it. And as anyone who's done, been in STS knows, it's never sufficient. There's never enough information there to really replicate. But it's still a stab. It, it's a stab in the right direction. Through most of the history of science, however, data, the full sets of data, belonged to the creator of the data and were never really reviewed or processed by anyone else. 
you know, if you do an experiment in your lab, what you, what you publish is a graph that shows the, you know, kind of an analysis and summary of the data. You don't publish every single data point. And a lot of that was because they, uh, you know, data were big uh, in, you know, even in other periods, too big to publish. You know, it would be many, many pages of a journal or it would be a book length thing and most people would never use it, so why would you do it? So data were sometimes shared, were sometimes reviewed, but mostly they were just accepted uh, as synthesis. <laughs> so uh, just switching over to the truce and target ideas for a minute, the World Weather Watch is a current system. It's been around since the 1960s. Integrates data from all these different kinds of instruments up here. Uh, through computer systems in a few major weather centers and then sends those the processed data back to national weather services which then sometimes do more processing and make their own forecasts and specialized uh, data sets. So there are lots of conflicts here and if you study the history of it you see all kinds of things like different uh, temperature scales, different pressure scales, different ideas about the relation between one instrument and another, many, many other things. Uh, there's, there was a lot of worry about national sovereignty, particularly after World War II when the UN was forming, you know, fear that it would be this kind of world police that would take everything over and, and resisted by, among other things, national weather services. And yet, it works. It's a truce. These tensions are still there. Uh, but the World Meteorological Organization established some standards that are pretty widely used and routines that are pretty widely used, and that's how the thing functions. One of the pieces of that truce is what they call four-dimensional data assimilation. It's really complicated, so I'm not going to try to explain it in detail, but basically A weather forecast model is a gigantic collection of algorithms that function together to simulate what's happening in the atmosphere. And surprisingly, the way it works is not that it starts with, with observed data and moves to a forecast. Instead, it starts with the previous simulated weather system, the previous forecast, the algorithmic output, and then it takes in data from observations and corrects that. So the way they like to talk about it is there are parts of the world where there's not, there's not, there aren't very many instruments, especially in the oceans. And uh, in those places, the forecast model can carry information from a place where there are lots of instruments to a place where there are fewer instruments a few hours or days later, right? So it is able to generate information that isn't there in the observations. And I love this example. I've got to show you this. So this is 1988, and these guys are the pioneers of a, a very uh, high-grade 4D data assimilation system. And they say a realistic global analysis model can be viewed as a unique and independent observing system that can generate information at a scale finer than that of the conventional observing system. And here's their example. So there's this period between the 25th and the 30th of August in 1985 when the, the communication system for weather data breaks in North Africa. And during this period, only these stations up here are transmitting data at all. So there's this vast area where there are simply no observations. Now, just to give you a sense of the size of that, that's a map of the United States. Right? So this is a colossal area. So this is the forecast for the 29th of August made by the weather model at the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts. And it shows this vortex here in the Sahara. And this is the Meteosat photograph of that same area, and there's the vortex. It may be hard to see, but it's right here. It's kind of a sandstorm that can be, that can be seen. So 
the, the model has carried information for four days since the last set of observations from this area and correctly predicted a phenomenon in the middle of the desert where there are no, no data at all. Okay, moving on to climate controversies. I'm gonna talk about three of them. And now, we're, now I'm not gonna talk about the Nelson and Winter sense of target anymore. I'm talking about targeting as aiming at uh, overturning the consensus on climate change. So the first one is the, the one known as the hockey stick. And this all starts around the turn of the millennium. This scientist Michael Mann, you've probably heard of by now because he's become very famous because of this problem. He and his colleagues published this graph, which is called the hockey stick because it, you know, here's the handle of the stick and here's the blade. Uh, it, it's a reconstruction of global temperature over the last 1,000 years. And it's got two parts. It's got this piece, which is all made from proxy data, like tree rings and corals, you know, things that that correlate with temperature, but they're not thermometers. They don't directly measure it. And then here, the red lines are observations from, from thermometers, you know, the, the, the historical instrument record. So, you know, you can see it bounces around a lot. Uh, there's a, these are error bars, and they get larger as we go back in time, of course. Uh, but what it doesn't contain is this the so-called medieval warm period. So this graph was first drawn in 1965 by uh, Hubert Lamb, a very good climatologist from England. And he, you know, what he saw was that, uh, you know, up through about 1900, there's this, this phase where you get a, a period warmer than 1900, and then another period the, known as the Little Ice Age, where it's colder. And even by 1900, we're still not as warm as the medieval warm period. So the thing is, this claim was based mainly on records from England, so one place. But the claim was that this was a global phenomenon. Now, climate skeptics didn't like this. They said, man, got rid of the medieval warm period. And if we superimpose this graph, you can see that that's true. There is, this, is, this period is warmer than this period in man's graph down here. But it's, sorry, uh, it's still not nearly as warm as Lamb had suggested. All right? So this character named Steve McIntyre, who is a Canadian, in fact, a retired mining engineer, uh, he started a blog in 2003. That was the era of blogs when everybody was doing this. And it's, you know, it, it has a very uh, kind of amateur science feel to it. McIntyre is very good with statistics. He knows his way around a spreadsheet. And he decided he was going to try to replicate what man had done. So he's, if you look at this, uh, there's a lot here, and I won't go through all of it, but so it's a website for a paper. So remember, this guy's an amateur, but he's going he's to try to publish a scientific paper. Um, corrections to the proxy database. And he has this idea of an audit. Now, if you are a corporation, you have to get your books audited every year or so. And the key thing is that you can't have your books audited by someone who works for you because that would be corrupt. Right? They have an incentive to give you the answers that you want to hear. So you take your books to an independent auditor. And McIntyre's idea was climate science should work like this too. Can't be audited by climate scientists because they have an interest. So it needs to be audited by someone else. And that's going to be him. <coughs> So he's got source data, he's got code, and he's publishing them on the web. This is kind of you know, pioneering in this period for him to do this. And he get, co collects followers around this project, and they begin to contribute and discuss. And a lot of it is actually very serious. And, and, and you know, it's, a, it's amateur, but it's still good work. And by uh, 2004, he's gone to a full-on 
uh, climate audit blog, which as you see has won some awards. Um, and you know, if you read this thing, you, you'll see he's saying, you know, we're going to have a calm scientific discussion. We're not trying to, uh, to be jerks about this, but we're going to audit. And this developed into a colossal controversy. So McIntyre started, you know, first he asked for man for data. Man is kind of a prickly guy. I know him. He's a, he's a good guy, but he's very difficult to deal with sometimes. And man didn't like this, so he just said, it's on an FTP site. Go get it. Uh, McIntyre couldn't quite understand it, what he was seeing, and he began asking more and more questions, and man just kind of blew him off. Uh, this, McIntyre escalated this all the way to hearings in the U.S. House Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigation. They demanded basically everything man had ever done, all his data, all his code, all his funding sources. And it escalated even further with more investigations by the National Science Foundation, the National Research Council, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and on and on and on. Well, here is the result of these professional audits, shall we say. These are different uh, reconstructions of the same period of time done by different independent groups. And what they find is basically that there was Man did make some mistakes in his analysis. McIntyre did find them. So that was a useful contribution. But it didn't change the overall result that today is warmer than any time in the last 1,000 years on the global scale. So here we have it again, the medieval warm period. You know, it's gone. <laughs> the Little Ice Age is still there. Um, and the, the present is you know, at this time, in the, about uh, 2006, uh, is warmer than at any time in the past. Now, this phenomenon has developed into a huge thing. It's kind of a form of citizen science. There are lots of people doing it now. Uh, this is an example of, you know, several different people and groups who took the, uh, the land surface temperature data sets and analyzed them with their own, you know, made their own algorithms for analyzing them and tried to see, and to see what would happen. And as you see, they're all very similar. So this turns into climate gate. Now, you probably remember this one. Um, and I, I, I'm not going to say as much as, about it as I could. You know, it's a leak of emails and data and uh, some other things from the Climatic Research Unit at the University of East Anglia in the UK. And I should say that, you know, I, I published this climate book in 2010, and I had sent the galleys off, you know, the final page proofs, back to the publisher about one month before this controversy broke. And I was completely sure that that book was going to fall into a black hole because no one, you know, every, it was, it, the controversy was over, you know, it was never going to, never going to come up again, and then this happened. So bits of this were about data. Phil Jones was one of the uh, major characters in this, in this debate, and uh, he sends this, this email to uh, to Mike Mann and some other people and says, we're getting hassled to release our station temperature data. Don't tell anybody that we have a Freedom of Information Act. <laughs> so uh, they're accused of hiding the data. Now, it should be said that they were being, they were under siege. That McIntyre filed 58 FOIA requests in one month to these people to try to get data from them. So they were caught up in this kind of legal hassle that just escalated and escalated and really saw it as kind of a battle. In the US, uh, James Inhofe, one of the most notorious climate change deniers in Congress, accuses them of unethical and possibly illegal behavior. There are emails discussing unjustified changes to data by federal employees and federal grantees. The criminal investigation idea did not go anywhere, but you know, it was a very serious accusation. Was there really a case there that the CRU actually manipulated data? Well, these are two other uh, major climate data centers 
and this is the, uh, the CRU data set. If you superimpose these lines, you really can hardly tell them apart, so they're offset on this graph to make them visible. So if other data centers are independently getting the same result, whatever the CRU is doing, it probably wasn't you know, fudging data in some kind of major way. But around this time, we begin to get things like this. And this is the, really the most dangerous part of this controversy, because the idea is scientists are in it for the money. You know, if you're a scientist, you're a scientist. Are you in it for the money? <laughs> Very few scientists are, you know, getting personally enriched by doing the research that they do. We have this kind of thing, you know, their climate scientists are cooking the thermometers, and this, you know, it's snowing outside. How can this be happening? They're manipulating the data. You know, it's not real. So another piece of this later was this guy, Richard Muller at Berkeley. He's a physicist, so he's a qualified auditor because he's not a climate scientist. <laughs> and Muller was a skeptic, a, a major climate skeptic, and uh, you know, very respected physicist, so uh, you know, useful for the skeptic cause. And he decided that they were going to do, he was going to do his own uh, version of the temperature data set for the world. And they began collecting new station records that had never been picked up before and adding them to the data set that they had. And they did this unbelievable thing. I mean, it's really amazing. So, you know, here are global data sets going back to 1880. And you see that up through 1963, we're talking about relatively small numbers of stations. Um, so if you get a finer grain look at things, will it be better? Maybe. So they keep adding stations. And this is the data set, the CRU data set, uh, 4,300 stations. But Mueller, in 2012, has 39,000 stations. Now, a lot of those, the records don't go back that far. So it's less impressive than it might seem. But it is a really serious attempt to collect the most, the largest possible amount of data and uh, use that in the, in the calculation. And here's what he found. <laughs> Now, when, when this, when he was not quite finished with this, it was still under peer review, Mueller was called up to Congress to testify. And the deniers, including Anthony Watts, who I'm going to talk about in a minute, um, said, well, whatever Mueller's doing, we're going to trust that. So Mueller gets up before Congress, and they ask him, you know, so what did you find? He said, well, it's still preliminary, but basically, we found the same thing that all the other people found. <laughs> <laughs> they did a good job, he said. <laughs> and, you know, then Watts goes, but wait for the peer review. Yeah. <laughs> but this is after peer review, and it didn't change very much at, at that point. So very, very similar results. All right, last piece, surfacestations.org, this character, Anthony Watts. He is a TV meteorologist, and his website, which is called What's Up With That, <laughs> is one of the most visited sites on the internet, and certainly one of the most visited sites in the climate change uh, universe, because he's a skeptic. So he, you know, and he's, he's not a fool, but he is uh, very committed to the idea that the, the station records are biased because of urban heat island effects. So, you know, a station, a weather station starts outside a city at an airport or something like that, and the city grows and it engulfs the weather station, and the whole area gets hotter because of all the asphalt and the exhaust and the, the uh, uh, power plants and things like that. So he set out to do another citizen science project to kind of check this. And this is the map of, of what he was doing. So he, sent, he called for volunteers to visit weather stations all over the country and use the weather service manual for station sighting to uh, describe what they saw and, and see if they could detect these urban heat island effects. And what they saw was really kind of amazing. So here you have the thermometer at a uh, at a weather station next to an asphalt parking lot and the exhaust fans of air conditioning units. 
Um, here, some of the electronics have been jammed into a, a, an uncomfortable box. We were shocked by what we found. Nine out of every 10 stations are reporting higher temperatures because they are badly sighted. So this sounds bad, and it sounds even worse when you see by how much they're estimating the, uh, the, the heat island effect to be. So they're saying here that the, the, the red and the orange here are between two degrees and more than five degrees centigrade above reading higher than they should. So if that's true, that's damning, and it's terrible. Interesting place where metadata from that project are now publicly available, because they're all published. You can look at every single uh, station review and investigate. So other scientists took those metadata and used them to look at what Watts had found, and they basically confirmed a lot of it. You know, they, did it they did a pretty good job with this audit. All of these are, so three, four, or five, according to surfacestations.org, those are biased high. All these red triangles biased high, you know, in their check. However, when you look at the, the output of the weather service, it turns out that not only is that effect not visible at all, in fact, the station records are biased slightly cool because the weather service knows about this and has used its algorithms to adjust the data. <laughs> So, you know, their conclusion was the adjustments largely account for the instrument, the impact of instruments and sighting. The main thing that's here is a small cool bias in the station readings. I'm going to skip that in the interest of time. Okay, last piece here. You know, the, the thing about the glass laboratory is that today it's not out in the woods with the small community of expert scientists hanging around outside. It's like here. <laughs> Everyone can look in. So open access sounds great, sounds democratizing, sounds important, and it is. I don't deny that. But it also opens up the possibility for people who don't have the requisite expertise to see things that you know, worry them and, and try to attack them. So we have these kinds of phenomena. The emails from ClimateGate are available on a, on a grepper. You can search the, all the emails. Somebody took the trouble to build this thing and suggest searches on things like uh, hockey stick, hide the decline. There is, you know, many climate scientists are literally under siege with FOIA requests. And a lot of them, you know, for emails, viewed by the skeptics as metadata about the fudging of data that they imagine. This organization, E&E &E Legal, uh, specializes in FOIA requests. This is a legal firm. And it is, its slogan is, free market environmentalism through strategic litigation. <laughs> so the, the weak counterattack mounted by the climate scientists is to develop their own legal defense fund and, you know, full disclosure, I contribute to this. Most recently, Lamar Smith, who is the chair of the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee, he's been there, been there since 2013, he's a skeptic, constantly trying to find ways to uh, attack the science and using language that kind of sounds right, but when you scratch under the surface, it's all there to ex pull out uh, pieces of data and analysis that he thinks are, skept are, are wrong and, and attack them. And this, in particular, this paper came out in 2015. Uh, it made more data adjustments that kind of got rid of the so-called hiatus in global warming that was supposedly <coughs> happening in the first part of the 21st century. Uh, Smith went after NOAA and went after all the email, as usual. Uh, and there's been a kind of standoff ever since. The, the NOAA officials have refused to give it to him. I don't know what's happening at the moment, but that was true at least six months ago. So, you know, now we get more fake news kinds of things from Breitbart. We have the, uh, the EPA just deleting science from its project 
you know, we're going to get rid, they've gotten rid of 38 members of a 49 member committee of scientific advisors, and on and on and on. So here's the most recent thing, and I just discovered this myself about a week ago. So I've been taking screenshots of data.gov periodically since they started handling climate data. So this piece is you know, the search on climate, and it's the data catalog. This shot was taken in November, and I just went back a few days ago, and I wasn't really expecting to see anything, but I saw this. Now, I don't know what that means, and I'm not making a claim about it, because it could just be that they're retagging things in some way, or, you know, it may be innocuous, but it's worrying, because this is exactly the kind of thing that people feared when the Trump administration came into office, and certainly has been an agenda of this administration. Okay, so last slide here. What we've got, here's the siege, you know, the, the traditional paradigm in science is that you have experts who are highly trained and they certify each other's results. In that ancient world of the 20th century and before, you know, the data analysis tools required very specialized skills. Most people couldn't operate them even if they had access to them and most people didn't have access. Expertise required a lot of training. Today, we have a new paradigm coming out, and that's one in which authority is based more on messaging and repetition than on expertise. And it's become very difficult for many people to tell the difference between expert science and what it, these kinds of amateur and deliberately uh, 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 you know, kind of attack mode things. We have many venues for so-called publication, including not only regular scientific journals, more and more of them, but also journals, in quotes, which are the fake journals you may have been invited to contribute to. Um, tools for data analysis are easy to get. You know, packages are they're free, any, and they're easy to use. So many, many more people have both the tools and the skills to uh, do some sort of analysis and make things that look like scientific work, uh, even if they're not really. The thing is, to be an expert, you really still need a lot of training. So a lot of what we see is data processed by people who don't understand what they're doing. I'll stop there, thanks.